Ms. Quickstead, I also like to ask you to introduce yourself. Can you tell us how you found yourself in Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021? Good evening, uh, Chair and Madam Vice Chair. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as stated in the winter of 2020, I was working on a documentary. As part of that documentary, I filmed several rallies in Washington, D.C. on December the 11th and December the 12th, and I learned there would be a rally on the Mall in, on January 6. So my three colleagues and I came down to document the rally. According to the permit of the event, there was going to be a rally at the Ellipse. We arrived at the Mall and observed a large contingent of Proud Boys marching towards the Capitol. We filmed them, uh, and almost immediately I was separated from my colleagues. I documented the crowd turn from protesters to rioters to insurrectionists. I was surprised at the size of the group, the anger and the profanity. And for anyone who didn't understand how violent that event was, I saw it, I documented it, and I experienced it. Uh, I heard incredibly aggressive chanting, and I shared, subsequently shared that footage with the authorities. I'm here today s pursuant to a House subpoena. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Quested. The Select Committee has conducted extensive investigative work to understand what led the Proud Boys and other rioters to the Capitol on January 6th. We've obtained substantial evidence showing that the President's December 19th tweet calling his followers to Washington, D.C. on January 6th energized individuals from the Proud Boys and other extremist groups. I'd like to play a brief video highlighting some of this evidence. My name is Marcus Childress, and I'm an investigative counsel for the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacist and white like me to condemn? White Proud Proud supremacists Boys. and right Proud, Proud Boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by. Uh, after he made this comment, Enrique Terrio, then chairman of the Proud Boys, said on parlor, standing by, sir. During our investigation, we learned that this comment during the presidential debate actually led to an increase in membership from the Proud Boys. Would you say that Proud Boys members increased after the stand back, stand by comment? Exponentially. I'd say tripled, probably, with the potential for a lot more eventually. And did you ever sell any stand back and stand by merchandise? Uh, one of the vendors on my page actually beat me to it, but I wish I would have. <laughs> I wish I would have made a stand back, stand by shirt. On December 19th, President Trump tweeted about the January 6th rally and told attendees, be there, we'll be wild. Many of the witnesses that we interviewed were inspired by the president's call and came to DC for January 6th. But the extremists, they took it a step further. They viewed this tweet as a call to arms. A day later, the Department of Justice describes how the Proud Boys created a chat called the Ministry of Self-Defense Leadership Chat. Uh, in this chat, the Proud Boys established a command structure in anticipation of coming back to D.C. on January 6. The Department of Justice describes Mr. Tario coming into possession of a document called the 1776 Returns, which describes uh, individuals occupying key buildings around the United States Capitol. The Oath Keepers are another group that the committee investigated. You better get your ass to D.C., folks, this Saturday. Yeah, if you don't, there's, there'll be no more republic. But we're not going to let that happen. It's not even an if. It's, it's either President Trump is encouraged and, and bolstered and strengthened to do what he must do, or we wind up in a, in a bloody fight. We all know that. The fight's coming. The Oath Keepers began planning to block the peaceful transfer of power shortly after the November 3rd election. And according to the Department of Justice, Stuart Rhodes, the Oath Keepers' leader, said to his followers that we were not going to get through this without a civil war. In response to the December 19th, 2020 tweet by President Trump, the Oath Keepers focused on January 6th in Washington, D.C. In response to the tweet, one member, the president of the Florida chapter, put on social media, the president called us to the Capitol. He wants us to make it wild. The goal was for the Oath Keepers to be called to duty so that they could keep the president in power, although President Trump had just lost the election. The committee learned that the Oath Keepers set up quick reaction forces outside of the city in Virginia where they stored arms. The goal of these quick reaction forces was to be on standby just in case President Trump invoked the Insurrection Act. Did the Oath Keepers ever provide weapons to members? 
I'm going to decline to answer that on Fifth Amendment grounds for, for uh, and due process grounds. In footage obtained by the committee, we learned that on the night of January 5th, Enrique Tarrio and Stuart Rhodes met in a parking garage in Washington, D.C. There's mutual respect there. I think we're, we're fighting the same fight, and I think that's what's important. The committee learned that the Oath Keepers went into the Capitol through the east doors in two stack formations. The DOJ alleges that one of the stacks went into the Capitol looking for Speaker Pelosi, although they never found her. As the attack was unfolding, Mr. Tarrio took credit. In documents obtained by the Department of Justice, Mr. Tarrio said in an encrypted chat, make no mistake, and we did this. Later on that evening, Mr. Tarrio even posted a video which seemed to resemble him in front of the Capitol with a black cape. And the title of the video was Premonition. The evidence developed by the Select Committee and the Department of Justice highlights how each group participated on the attack on the Capitol on January 6. In fact, the investigation revealed that it was individuals associated with the Proud Boys who instigated the initial breach at the Peace Circle at 12.53 p.m. <laughs> Within 10 minutes, rioters had already filled the Lower West Plaza. By 2 o'clock, rioters had reached the doors on the West and the East Plazas. And by 2.13, rioters had actually broken through the Senate wing door and got into the Capitol building. A series of breaches followed. At 2.25 p.m., rioters breached the east side doors to the rotunda. And then right after 2.40 p.m., rioters breached the east side doors near the Ways and Means Room. Once the rioters infiltrated the Capitol, they moved through the crypt, the rotunda, the hallways leading to the House chambers, and even inside the Senate chambers. Individuals associated with two violent extremist groups have been charged with seditious conspiracy in connection with the January 6th attack. One is the Oath Keepers. They are a group of armed anti-government extremists. The other group is the Proud Boys. They promote white supremacist beliefs and have engaged in violence with people they view as their political enemies. Members of both groups have already pled guilty to crimes associated with the January 6th attack. Guilty to crimes associated with the January 6th attack. Mr. Quested, as part of the documentary you've been filming, you gain access to the Proud Boys and their leader, Enrique Tarrio. Your crew filmed them in Washington, D.C. on the evening of January 5th and then on January 6th. On January 5th, the night before the attack, you were with the head of the Proud Boys, Mr. Tarrio, in Washington, D.C. What happened? Uh, we picked up Mr. Tario from jail. Uh, he'd uh, been arrested for carrying uh, some magazines, uh, some long, uh, some extra capacity magazines, and uh, for the he took responsibility for the burning of the uh, Black Lives Matter flag that was stolen from the church um, on December the twelfth. Um, we um, we were attempting to get an interview with Mr. Tario. Um, we had no idea of any of the events that were going to subsequently happen. Um, uh, we drove him to pick up his bags from the property department of the police, which is just south of the mall. Uh, we picked up his bags and went to get some other bags from the Phoenix Hotel, where we um, encountered Mr. Stuart Rhodes uh, from the Oath Keepers. Um, by the time I'd gone to park the car, my colleague was saying, who'd got into the car with Mr. Tario, that they had moved to a uh, location around the corner, the parking garage of the uh, Hall of Legends, I believe. And um, so we quickly drove over there. We drove down into the parking garage, 
and filmed the scene of Mr. Tarrio and Mr. Rhodes uh, and certain other individuals um, uh, in that garage. Um, we then continued to follow Mr. Tario. There was some discussion about where he was going to go. He ended up going towards a hotel in Baltimore, and we conducted an interview with him in the hotel room. Um, and then we returned to DC for that night. Uh, in a, um, and what was interesting that night actually was that was the first indication that DC was much more um, busy than it had been any other time we'd been here because we couldn't get into the hotels we wanted to and we um, ended up at a hotel that you know was not as satisfactory as we would have hoped. Thank you. So what you're saying is you filmed the meeting between Mr. Tario and Oath Keeper's leader, Stuart Rose, right? Indeed. You couldn't hear what was said, but according to the Justice Department indictment of Mr. Tario, a participant referenced the Capitol. Now, on the morning of January 6th, you learned the Proud Boys would gather near the rally schedule to take place near the White House. What time did you meet up with the Proud Boys and what was happening when they met? Um, we met up with the Proud Boys uh, somewhere around 10.30 a.m. and they were starting to walk down the mall uh, in easterly direction towards the Capitol. Um, there was a, 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 a large contingent, more than I had expected, and I was confused to a certain extent why we were walking away from the president's speech because that's what um, I felt we were there to cover. So at 10.30 a.m., uh, that's early in the day, that's even before the President Trump had started speaking, am I correct? Yes, sir. So how many Proud Boys would you estimate were marching together to the Capitol? Um, a couple of hundred. Potentially, yeah, I'd say a couple of hundred Proud Boys were marching towards the Capitol at that point. At the time, was the area heavily guarded? No, that was, um, we mem I remember we walked past the, we walked down the mall, we walked to the ref right of the reflecting pool, and then north along the road that leads to the Peace Circle. And as we were walking past the Peace Circle, I framed the Proud Boys to the right of my shot with the Capitol behind, and we see one sole police officer um, at the barriers, which are subsequently breached. We then walk up and past a um, tactical unit preparing, and there's, you see that in the film where the man questions their duty and their honor, and you see maybe a dozen um, uh, Capitol Police um, putting on their riot gear. So, how would you describe the atmosphere at that, that time? The atmosphere was, it seemed to be much darker. I, I make efforts to create um, a familiarity between myself and my subjects to you know, make them feel comfortable. And um, the, the atmosphere was much darker than, at this day than, than had been in these other, in these other, in these other days. And there was also a contingent of Proud Boys that I hadn't met before from Arizona who appeared to wear these orange hats um, and had orange armbands. So when the Proud Boys went back down the hill to the peace circle, did a larger crowd start together? Well, no. First of all, we went round to the back and down the steps and we took some photographs on the east side of the Capitol. Uh, and then we went for lunch. We went for tacos. So, Mr. Quested, you're a journalist, so you are careful to stick to things that you have observed. But what you've told us is highly relevant. Let me highlight a few key facts that you and others have provided the committee. First, there was a large group of proud boys present at the Capitol. We know that from multiple sources. You now estimate that there were around 250 uh, to 300 individuals that you've testified. 
They weren't there for President Trump's speech. We know this because they left that area to march toward the Capitol before the speech began. They walked around the Capitol that morning. I'm concerned this allowed them to see what defenses were in place and where weaknesses might be. And they decided to launch their attack at the Peace, Peace Circle, which is the front door of the Capitol complex. It's the first security perimeter that those marching from the ellipse would have to come to as they moved toward the Capitol. The Peace Circle walk away was, walkway was always where the thousands of angry Trump supporters would arrive after President Trump sent them from the lips. The Proud Boys timed their attack to the moments before the start of the joint session in the Capitol, which is also where President Trump directed the angry mob, quote, we fight like hell, end quote. He told them before sending them down Pennsylvania Avenue, right to where the Proud Boys gathered and where you are filming. Now, a central question is whether the attack on the Capitol was coordinated and planned. What you witnessed is what a coordinated and planned effort would look like. It was the culmination of a months long effort spearheaded by President Trump. Mr. Quested, thank you for your eyewitness account of the lead up to the breach of the peace circle. 